we are here to bring you everything and anything surrounding Porsche. I'm Mike. I'm Aaron. And this is P-Car Talk. Welcome to another episode of P-Car Talk. I'm Mike. And I'm Aaron. We are in the studio and happy holidays. You'll be hearing this on yeah. New Year's Eve, essentially, right? Hope we had a good Not Christmas. essentially, you will. Yeah. So... Happy New Year. I hope you had a great Christmas. I hope Santa Claus Monica, brought you some. Festivus, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Holidays. Let's just put it that way, right? <laughs> Hopefully you got some goodies. Um, if you didn't, I'm sorry, but um, you could have gotten some goodies from us, right? Albert yeah. ended up winning uh, the 24-hour Daytona tickets from us. Yeah, he did. So congratulations to him. Um, yep. That came out on our Tuesday live feed if you didn't see that. Um, so, you know, next month... Stay tuned to see what we're going to be giving away next month. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be something good like we always do. Before we get started, let's go ahead and give some shout outs to some new members. Yep. We have some new P Car Club members Mark P, Drew H, Ethan M, Bobby K, and Todd C. Thank you guys for helping support the show. Um, we couldn't do things without new members like you that are joining. And additionally, we have second year renewals from yep. Ethan C, Andy G. George L, Matthew A, Andrew L, Paul C, Dwayne C, and Richard P. And we can't continue to do what we're doing without your added support. So you guys are already moving on to year two. Congratulations to you guys. You guys are already the senior team. We have some JV guys who just came in. So we'll make sure we get them schooled up. And don't forget... You can also become a PCAR Club member, right? So that yep. helps support our show. We'll get into that spiel later, but let's go ahead and get rolling on the show. So what do we have today? We have Carrera GT talk a little bit, a unique one to talk about. Yeah. We have some Safari cars, a little bit of history background because everybody thinks that this is a new fad. Actually, this is from the 70s. <laughs> this started. has been going on. So like, you know, we'll give you the, you know, the breakdown on that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, we have some collaborations coming up. Um, with uh, an open house that we're going to end up doing with a speed shop. And then we're going to talk a little bit about 997 RWBs a little bit, how that's, what the dynamic of that's going to look like, um, what the potential impacts that might have on the Nakai's business, what, all that stuff. So we'll get into all that. So let's get rolling. Carrera GT. Um, The reason why this is news is because this car is currently for sale. This isn't something that was just done recently. This guy has owned this car from new, what I understand from the article. Um, decide to make the Carrera GT a full-blown race car. Um, yeah, which I don't know that I've seen the car anywhere else, like, till now. No, it's... but it's got 1,200 track miles on it, so yeah. it's lapping some track somewhere, but uh, it's all over social media currently, and rightfully so because it's up for sale. So you want to see as many people want to see it as possible, and you want as much traction on it as possible, and we're adding to that traction, I yeah. guess. Um, so it's for sale currently at a, a million dollars. Um, what makes this kind of unique uh, this gentleman bought this car brand new uh, in Belgium. So he kind of wanted a GT3, but esque, if you can imagine that, with a Carrera GT. So they didn't make a GT3 track model really for the, the Carrera GT at all. It wasn't a homologated car in any type of race or anything like that. It was just basically for, you know, collectors and all that kind of stuff. And it was a street going car, and that's what it was. So this guy basically wanted to make it hardcore, he wanted to step it up. Yeah. So he gutted the interior, like basically replaced everything with carbon fiber, put a roll cage in it, um, you know, upgraded the clutch, pumped this thing out to about 650 horsepower. It came stock with 600, um, you know, changed the fuel management system, put a MoTeC in it, um, changed the front wishbone to like basically RSR type stuff so yeah. it could handle a little bit better, um, put a really cool vintage style mobile livery on it. Um, this thing has race brakes on it. It has air jack system on it. So this is like he went. Yeah, went he went above and beyond. Yeah. Think, I, when I saw it, I was like, oh, cool. He's got a livery. And then yeah. I saw the interior and I was like, oh, okay, so it's like a This is hardcore. Car. Yeah. That's, Essentially a Carrera GT cup car. Yeah, um, insane. Now, the interesting part about this, now that you guys have the background on what this actually is, we want to talk a little bit about. What are your thoughts on this? Is this is this defacing a, a vehicle in your opinion? Did he take something that was really special and make it like not special now because he's done all of this? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know that it's not. I think it's cooler because it's his, his own little flair, and I don't think that anyone has done to this length. And kind of, he didn't really re undo anything. He kind of put it the way it was going to be in the attention uh, the first place. It's going to be a race car. Yeah, just didn't happen. 
Um, I don't know it's worth the million dollars. I mean, it is still a Carrera GT, so there's there's value there. Mm-hmm. But and that's about what a Carrera GT goes for is about a million, yeah. like unmolested. If depending on how you look at this, right? Like if you're a pure collector, you're not going to be a buyer on this car anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. But again, this is a essentially a one of one. Um, I think it makes it get into a very unique category because of what it is. I think there's that one person who does probably have that FU money out there who's going to say, yeah, I've got a regular career GT already, and yeah, I man. do have some FU money. This is really cool what this guy did to it. I'd like to have a race version of like what I already have. That would be kind of cool. The money to do it. Yeah, yeah. and that would be kind of cool because I do have the FU money, and that would be cool. I I'm could not doing see, that to my car, but... Since yeah, it's already done. and I could see somebody wanting to do that. Um, would, I, uh, would you have chosen the mobile one livery for your for a GT? I think it's pretty neat. I mean, it's. I think the challenging part about it is not necessarily the livery. I think it's the dynamic of everything else in the car. As mm-hmm. far as like, this is super hardcore, right? Like, yeah, the car only fiber, all the toggles. Everything. Yeah, it's it's as race car as I've ever seen anything. Once you once you put air jacks on a car. It's, it's that you're there. <laughs> you, it, if you don't know what air jacks are, people, you haven't watched a race or any of that stuff. It's basically you just hook up a compressed air system to it and the car has its own lift system. So mm. where you don't have to slide a jack into it, like in the pits, like they used to back in the day, this thing like has a four post lift inside of it, essentially raises yeah. it up off the ground. You can pull the center lock wheels off, put on some new ones and boom, you're out of there. Um, you know, RSRs have that, you know? So, so do you think he was hoping, like, he built this thing that his friends would be like, you know what, that's pretty cool. Let me build one, and then we can have a race series, or... You know, I don't really know, because it didn't get into the details of the owner of, like, what the grand idea was. Clearly, um, so, and it says that of the 1,200 miles that are on the track, mm-hmm. nearly all of them are track miles. So the guy puts it on track, um, the car, you know, didn't get into any type of accident history, so you know, forgive us for that. And we're not going to report what we, what we know. So I can't tell you like, well, maybe it was a total car and this is what he did. Like you're playing all these maybe what if like, games right maybe now. Maybe it's Jackie X or somebody See, from, from <laughs> race car. what we understand is he bought the thing new yeah, and he's owned it from mm-hmm. the beginning. And this is, was always his vision for it. So if he bought the thing new, it's an 05. He's had it for 15 years. Yeah. It's time. So he did what he wanted to do with it. it. Obviously, he didn't buy it because he was worried about an investment piece. He wanted to go racing with this particular car. And I think that's neat in itself to say, hey, that's cool. I want to go do that. You guys never made a race car version of this. This is my idea of what you would have made it look like or it would have been close to this. Now he's just getting into some vintage racing now. He could go do. I mean, it's just getting to that point where it's old enough. Yeah, and then that's the next thing too is the value of the car, it's still a Carrera GT at the end of the day. It still carries that VIN. It's all of those things. And if it's never been wrecked and it's on the track, do you, how hard do you really track this when you own it? If you do or own it for that purpose, like this gentleman, I don't know anything about him, but I do, I, you know, we read the article. How hard was he really tracking this thing? Because I'm was he like with, that I'm, ballsy to I'm like, where with, if he crashed a million dollars and, and left it on the track, he didn't give a shit? thousand percent i hardcore. don't know man oh, when i saw him do a burnout and i was like oh, i saw if, that too i was like what is still. this and all of a sudden i was like oh, okay that's why yeah i mean i but you again, the money to replace it you yeah. like to think that i mean you can't always assume that just because you have you have endless funds hopefully, or hopefully, close to I mean, endless funds certain things aren't replaceable though right because like yeah. okay he's done all that work to that, that car to get it to that point the word on the street is he spent over 220,000 pounds to convert it to the way it was on okay. top of the, what he paid for the car. So you do the math on that, that's close upwards of like almost $300,000. Yeah. So you don't, I don't care who you are, you still value dollars. Like you, you don't want to. probably over time or back uh, yeah, in the day. Exactly. It's like, probably cheaper. It's probably more expensive now to do the same and thing. And even if he did, it could replicate it and do it again. One thing you can never get back is time. Yeah. So it took time to do that. It's not like it just shows up and it's like that didn't take time. So well, he's like memories of the car being on those certain tracks wherever he's had it. And that yeah, it just man. doesn't disappear. So, I mean, do you think he really runs at night? I mean, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. I know we're playing the what if game. We don't know. But I'm going to believe in that he does 100%. He's in it. Yeah. Doesn't care. Would you run it like that? And you have like if you had the money to do all of those I things. I think if I converted to that, yes. 
because that's that, that was in its that's the intended purpose. That's why you and did if it. I'm not, right? And if I'm not gonna if I'm not gonna go ten tenths with it, then there's I shouldn't have even started this journey. Yeah, I mean it's pretty badass that this is this is this thing exists. Why well, am that the motor's still together? Yeah, well, I think what the most interesting thing about all of this is is that this guy is obviously pretty modest because he's owned the car and probably his inner circle. And I'm sure there's other people that kind of knew maybe this existed. If you're a career GT aficionado or something like that, like those people probably know of this car, but I would say like outliers like us where that car's not even in my, in my radar. Yeah. So why would I even know this existed other until this thing basically showed up on social media, like four or five days ago and just went ape shit. (laughs) And you know, it's a great advertising ploy. Somebody's going to see it and probably wants it and doing all of those crazy, sexy things. And yes, it's still road legal. I mean, it's got a street VIN and it's got a number plate on it. And so if you're a buyer on this, do you think that the next buyer tracks it or do you think he buys it? Cause it's one of those cool things, but now he's got a race Carrera <laughs> GT for the street Ooh. Hmm. because it's street legal. Yeah. Cause it's registered. It's got a, it doesn't have one of those cup car vins where it's unregisterable. It's definitely, um, definitely a cool, like a uh, rally car type situation. Like, yeah. Hey, let's go. Oh, you guys are, you guys are doing rally. Yeah. Oh, I'm in. Yeah. And it, that would be what they're bringing crazy just, flex. Oh, yeah. Okay. People show up and they're like, Oh, I got a Zonda. I'm like, yeah, cute Zonda dude. Like you pull up in that yeah. thing and you're like, what is that thing? You're like, yeah, this is a Carrera GTR. The thing I like, I don't even know what that is. It's so nasty sounding straight pipe. Mm hmm. What do you think Porsche thinks of this car? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, at this point, with how they're caring about their heritage, I don't. I think they may be like, eh, well, it's kind of cool, but mm-hmm. maybe you, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but I mean, they're celebrating all kind of stuff now. I, I think that maybe. Um, I mean, look at like some of the uh, out like brands that they not brands, but cars that people have like done their own thing to that they're even celebrating. You know, yeah. like. You see Porsche affiliating with people that make safari cars, people that, and they're not making those from the factory, Mm -hmm. but I won't, you know, and people are modifying cars and they're outlawing cars and you see Porsche supporting those kind of things. I don't know if, I wonder if they would be even interested in this car. I think it'd be kind of a a cool exercise for them to maybe even buy this car. This is what the Courage you could have been. Like, you could have been had we went race car with it. And them kind of like poke and prod it around and, evaluate it to see if that's something that the way they would have made it. Or at least bring him inside and say, Hey, here's our prototype. I mean, this guy's from Belgium. I mean, he's (laughs) obviously a Porsche fan. Like I'm sure he didn't, he didn't spare any expense. Like I'm sure this isn't like some kind of like, that's wonky. I wouldn't have done it that way. Like if Porsche, I'm sure if Porsche evaluates this, they're like, you did this better than we probably would have done this. I'm sure they have a prototype race car. Oh, they all have types of crazy stuff laying around, but I think it's pretty, pretty neat. Do you think, the asking price is accurate for what this is. I think for the going rate of a normal career G- GT, probably be in, in the eight hundred range, mm-hmm. and then him having the two hundred thousand euros or pounds or whatever, mm-hmm. pound, wherever he got the work done. Um, I think it's right. I think it's spot on. I I don't know that like we don't pay for mods at any normal level. I don't know that anybody's gonna. Yeah, they'll be okay to pay for. I don't know it, if like they're gonna be like, level. "Hey, bro, can we get a discount?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can we knock off a hundred. I almost feel like when you're at that level, though, I, feel, I don't think it matters because you, you're not going to get another one. He's going to tell you, OK, go go find another one. Yeah, I think this is unique enough yeah. where like even though it's modded and it's done all that way, I think it's probably done tastefully enough where you can make the argument. And like I would I would say this car wouldn't do as well. But with over the last decade with race cars in general, not no. just Porsche cars, where X race cars have gone up incrementally across the board of everything i mean even like x nascars that they're collectible like people want certain cars that want certain races i mean look at all the f1 cars that want people want to collect you have x porsche car race cars that raced in the 70s people want like they bring in multi multi multi-million dollars even though this doesn't have race pedigree like some of those other cars it still is a fad where people want a race car in their garage um so if this becomes just even somebody's showpiece I still think that it, it, it commands a strong amount of money. I think time will obviously tell because, or maybe it won't, because unfortunately sometimes these things, if they do sell and they go for an undisclosed amount, I think, I think it then it protects. Like it did. 
and then, and then one, disappears again. See it again. Yeah, there's enough uh, oil money and Sultan money in the. The, I think it'd be cool to see this it. Thing, I wouldn't be surprised if this thing went that way. It's yeah, already in true. it's already in Europe. So yeah, it wouldn't be that far much farther away to get over to one of those Middle Eastern countries where things just disappear into a basement of collections. I still think it'd be cool if you took the livery off and just went like straight cup car, like all white, white everything else, kind of just super clean. Mm-hmm. But the livery has its own. own what well, has the flair of like what they would probably would have ran on it. Like, yeah. so it looks cool. Um, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Definitely wanted to throw some acknowledgement on that because it's kind of an exciting car, especially if you're a Carrera GT fan. And Maybe Dan Davis will grab a Carrera GT and throw in the collection. <laughs> yeah, put some Brumos livery on it. Oh, man. Um, so let's move on. Safari cars. Okay, so I know everybody kind of has you know their opinion on these things. Um, they're pretty popular at the moment. There's several different builders out there. Um, they don't need to be named. Obviously, you guys can do the research and figure them out. Um, this isn't a recent thing, though, even though it is a recent fad. Um, yeah. So going back as early as 1978, there was a group of uh, racers that wanted to go race in the East African Safari. If you're not familiar with that race, that's back in 78. The Dakar was kind of like dead at that point. Mm-hmm. So this kind of filled that gap. And a lot of sources say this rally actually is tougher than that one um, as far as the terrain. That's what I'd say too if I was doing a new rally. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was a new rally. I think, it, I think it exists. I think it was just more popular at the okay. time. Um, so it's almost like ebb and flow, like where maybe there wasn't a lot of sponsorship behind Dakar at the time and it got a lot of surgeons like l- later in the 80s. But anyways, that's a whole nother informational tutorial yep, that we can go nine. over some other time. Um, but in 78, they went to Porsche and said, hey, we want to race one of your 911s or two of your 911s to go do this. Can you help us do that? And Porsche says, Hey, we don't do that. We're not really interested in that. So this is pre nine, five, nine where they did the dog car. So this is way before this. So this is 78, uh, Porsche SC. This team ends up buying two of them from Porsche. Um, Porsche says, we'll sell you the cars, but we're not really going to do anything around it. We're not going to really support this race because we don't do that stuff. Um, so what this team ends up doing is getting Martini to sponsor them as a, a, a whole, um, so they're running two cars. They end up basically changing suspension on the car, making this thing ready for road rallying. Um, you know, putting the equipment that they need on it, extra spare tire, gas can, roof rack, stuff like that, lighting. Um, they change the suspension, but not like you would think. You're like, oh, they probably put some like crazy whatever cool was at that time, not like Fox, but Billistine or something like that. Yeah. And they ran some like huge travel. Nope. They took the torsion bars and they just basically flipped them and made the car sit higher put whatever off-road tire was cool in 78 that would handle this terrain properly. And they went, this car was pretty much brown stock minus some of the safety equipment on it. Mm. Um, that probably actually gave it like longevity. Yeah. And, um, and I'm not screwing around about saying that, like they took the torsion bar suspension, basically flip the spindles. If you know what that is, you basically flip spindles. If you want to like basically lower or higher something, like you just do them in reverse. Um, that's essentially what they ended up doing, you know, a little bit welding and a little bit more different stuff behind it. But that's the, the cliff notes version of it without getting into the suspension geeking of it. Um, nevertheless, they end up taking these two cars through this treacherous, treacherous journey, 94 hours, 3000 miles. Um, they did in these cars. They finished second and fourth. A non non backed Porsche team That's so many that miles. did this That's so oh, many miles. in such a short amount of time. Yeah. And then, so the fourth place car. So they were running one two. Yeah. The fourth place car ended up taking fourth because it went through a huge mud puddle, ripped the rear uh, axle like harness off of the car so they had to do a side side repair on the car and the car still finished fourth they limped it across at fourth no big deal so in 78 they were the only two cars tandem team at you know a two car entry they were mm-hmm. the only team that finished both cars now there were teams that finished but they may only finish one car so this porsche non-sanctioned team but martini sponsored team and i'm sure you guys have seen and if you haven't the, the pictures of them all over the internet they got martini splattered all over yeah. it they got huge headlights that's a set those are 78 scs guys um so what's happening now isn't revolutionary with these safaris and i'm not saying it in a negative way i'm not saying you 
it's a cool thing. It's almost paying homage to all of this stuff. But where I'm going with this is it shows the incredible durability of the 911. They took a yeah. bone stock 911, nearly bone stock suspension, threw some safety parts, threw some lighting on it, did what they need to do. They ran 3,000 miles across a hyena infested desert, essentially. Yeah with boulders and mud and this isn't like roads there were no roads everything was off road it wasn't like okay there's a little bit of tarmac and then there's none i think they think they uh, followed any break-in motor rules or just probably (laughs) not i mean probably didn't have time for it it's probably just went after it and you know it's one of those things they point and shot it down the road and let's just see let's see what happens here um i want to say that again though they these are brand new cars essentially they took across it went 3,000 miles over the roughest, nastiest cobblestone. Like, wherever you think is bad, it's way worse doing this. Oh, yeah. Ten times worse. Um, and you think about, like, now all the Baja stuff and all the suspension travel and all the unique stuff it has going on. This is 1978 technology going on these same surfaces. And these, these cars finished second and fourth with just a little bit adjustment to the torsion bar suspension on it. That just shows you... Tire technology from the 70s as well. Yeah, on top of that. Exactly. Great point. Where people are like, well, I don't know if I should buy like an old air cooled. I don't know how reliable it's going to be. Oh, this should answer your question. At least 3,000 miles over the most treacherous... Well, that's the thing is, most of those things, think about how babied a lot of those 70s and 80s 911s that you're potentially buying Mm. on the street. This thing got hammered in a dust bowl when it was filled full of nasty sand and mud and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it finished spiders, this. Yeah, exactly. Things. Who knows? Like, you know what happened to it out there? You know, and some people are like, well, you know, that was only 3000 miles. You know, this car has 130 on it. I'm looking at it. I guarantee 130,000 miles that car lived are a lot safer miles than the 3000. Yeah. The, the, the 3000, unfortunately, like this thing had, I mean, you go to like tried and tested. It. It's like, yeah, well, it's only got 3,000 miles on it. It's like, yeah, you dropped it from like a building, basically. Yeah. But what are your thoughts on, you know, so I'm leading up to the to the point here. The, the whole reason why I brought all this up is because of the trend of the, of the safari cars. Um, you know, after we've given the history lesson of where these things originated from, what do you feel about the new safari builds that are coming out uh, nowadays? Obviously, some of them, some of them are more... Um, sophisticated, obviously, than what the 78 was. There's a lot more creature comforts going into some of them, mm-hmm. like depending on who the builder is. Um, people put in their own flair on it. Obviously, we won't go down those rabbit holes. But in general, what is your general thoughts on these things? Hmm. I think I think it's a, I mean, like you said, it's, it's nothing that's new, but I think it's kind of, I don't know if it's like the last, the last frontier where people haven't really seen a lot of these and then now it's now that's why it's popular mm-hmm. or if they've just realized that there's another avenue of fun besides the racetrack that these cars can go on yeah. and, and do things or, and the versatility, like we kind of talked about with the thing that's going on with you. If yours, if you wanted to do a safari and keep your safari for the next million years, you would, mm-hmm. but if you want to turn it back into a race car, yeah. It goes back to a race car fairly easily. And yeah. So I, I think that people are just taking the chance on it's something new and fun and it, it's, it's more adventurous. Right? Yeah, it's, it's different. It's something that you can, you feel like you would with any other type of off-roading thing is you're going to adventure. You don't know what you're going to see. You mm-hmm. don't, you can go anywhere. I guess the capability thing is kind of what I believe sparks a lot of that stuff for the yeah. safari car. I agree with that. I think you made a very, very good point as far as it doesn't take too much to make this thing back into a sh- like a street car, mm. essentially, if you want to. Um, it basically, like, maybe two days of work on it can put this thing back without, like, beating it to death to try to make it something that it's not. And I think that alone is a very unique tool. Now, are people probably going to do that? Probably not. But the fact that you could do that mm. if you wanted to do that, I think, is, is very cool. Um, I also agree with... Adventure driving is pretty popular across the board. I think that has a big additive, like even outside of Porsche. Um, Jeep people have always been into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's crossing boards, right? Like where yep. I'm talking about is like Ford Raptor stuff, like when they started to come on scene about like eight or nine years ago and making their first gen for Ford Raptor and really pushing stuff like that where people are s- spending more time off, off-road, yep. where people are – taking all Offline, types of stuff, decompressing, exactly. doing their thing, you know, and, tents, you know, camping. the, the, 
the whole Land Cruiser group has always done their own mm-hmm. thing, right? But like that's even gotten more mainstream now as far as you very unique where it used to be before. There used to be a small group, but a lot more people are getting into it because they're making mm-hmm. so many more generations of them. So there's so much more opportunity for these things to buy used and for people to go, hey, it's pretty fun for me to go spend, i.e. on a Land Cruiser, go drop 12 grand, you know, put some different tires on it, um, maybe do a two inch suspension lift or something, go buy some like survival stuff and go hang out with my buddies or my family in the woods yeah. uh, for a weekend as opposed to before. And like, man, this thing's pretty capable as opposed to like, let's just go to the mall or soccer practice with this thing. Um, then you add in sports car and, and I think it kind of, yeah. And I think it, it kind of yeah. went into started to creep into that area, right? Where sports cars are starting to be off road where, in the U S it's never really been that big of a thing, but in Europe, it's always been a huge thing. Rallying's always been really, really big in Europe always. Um, and they have that DNA ingrained. So I'm probably, they're probably not surprised at all to see these because they, a lot of these races, all these group B races, all of this stuff was all in Europe. They did all of this stuff over there. So Americans, yeah, Americans don't really have all of this rallying and all of those they don't have the history the targa floria stuff all the stuff they've done over overseas and uh, in europe they've been doing it for decades Mm. so i think like anything over time we start to travel across the pond enough and we some of our guys start to bring it over here and you know they're start their pillars in the off-roading community or their own thing and they make it cool and other people see like wow this is capable i didn't know it could do this it's almost kind of an education on top of like seeing a thing that's already existed but you yeah. didn't really know and you're like wow that's really badass i can go out there and like you said i can have multiple 911s i it goes back to this being a swiss army knife the 911 yeah. having okay well i can have a track one i can have my everyday cruiser one, my daily one, and then I can have my rally one. Yeah. If you choose that, if, if that's your, if that's your life. Yeah. If that's who you want to be and that's what you want to do. Um, so I, it makes sense to me in a way. Um, do I ever think these things are going to be mainstream and we're going to see a ton of them? I don't think so because first of all, entry point on them is expensive, right? Let's get, yeah. let's, let's get over that to start with. You still have to buy an air cooled. Yep. It's almost kind of the RWB effect, which we'll talk about later, which is a different chassis on, that we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. But even when we've talked about it in the past, if you're going to do an RWB, your entry on an RWB anyways is expensive because yep. an air-cooled car is expensive, and then you're going to hack it up. But the difference with this is you don't have to hack up a Safari car. You can, like you said, yep. put it back to normal suspension. You may have to do a respray on it because you're going to pelt it up in the yeah. in the woods, yeah, as ratings. you should. Yep. Um but it's going to be pretty rad and pretty badass. Um, clearly, I'm on board. I'm having one built. Yeah. But uh, I think the neat thing about it is is what what appeals to me personally, why I, I want one. Does it is wash it ever? That. Yeah. This. So it it's not a, it's more than one thing. So I'll name okay. off all the things. And I don't I didn't count them out. So this is on the fly. So. I like the adventure drive idea to be able to get with other guys that have safaris or mm-hmm. off-road vehicles and want to go adventuring on gravel roads and dirt roads and stuff like that and go fast and have fun and do our mini own mini like group B rally style. I think that's awesome because it's cool to be able to not go on a track or in the mountains and maybe like a, sh- a track ready or track prep car. Mm-hmm. I think it's cool to be on a different terrain and do a whole different type of like situation, camping, all that kind of stuff. I think that's neat to be able to do that in a 911. I like the idea of not washing it, like you said. Um, because it's because for me, like I never used to wash my truck. It's like stress free ownership. I don't wash the Cayenne that much. No. It's stress free ownership. It's that's the daily. It's the it's the do all. And that's kind of how I'll treat this 911. It's it's gonna. It's supposed to do the dirty work. I'm not trying to make it pretty and do all these things. It's for me. It's to have fun. Of course, we're gonna do some stuff to it to make it look fun. But after that, that's the way it's gonna live. Um, so a lot of those things kind of appeal to me. Is why I was kind of interested in it. Not because I want to be part of that trend. I just like the idea of being able to get sideways, like in the mountains on a dirt road. Even if I'm the only one out there, I think that's awesome to and yeah. be able to do it in a 911. I mean, clearly you can do that with tons of different cars, but I think it's cool to be able to do it in a 911. Or see a trail and just... Oh, yeah, and just go that. for it yep. and just have fun with it. And and the, and I think it's it's pretty rad how capable they are too, where 
you can drive it on the tarmac and it's not like got the wah wah tires on it that are so bad where you're like, wow, this thing is not even streetable. Like I actually have to tow it to the trail because it's that bad. Yeah. So it's not that extreme either. And I know you've seen trail guys that have stuff built like that where they can't even drive it on the street because it's so track or so forest prepped and it's yeah. so trail prepped where they basically have to flatbed it there and then they drive it when it's there. Like this isn't that either. This is that like go between. Yeah. So Look that's middle, kind of middle road. Yeah, that's kind of like my my thought process behind it. But go look them up. There's a lot of them out there if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about. Uh, again, there's a bunch of builders that are building these cars out there. And I uh, don't want to bring light to anyone specifically regarding it. Um, I think eventually we're going to have Joe on who's yeah. building my car. And he's built several. Um, so we'll save that for that mm-hmm. episode and let him talk about it and the depth of what he ends up doing to them. Uh, so you'll get a little, this is a little teaser to that as far as, you know, what he brings to the table. Um, so let's talk real quick before we go on break. How do you support the membership? So, so you can do that by going on our Instagram. We have a link. Just click, hit Car Club. It takes you to the memberships. Click on that. Buy it. And then you're in. That's, I mean, that's yep. that simple. Or you can go to the website, com slash club and and it helps us because we've talked about it in other shows it really really makes a huge impact when you become a pcar club member because you are the dollars that basically infuse us with what we're doing there is no sponsorship money coming in you guys are the sponsorship money and in turn you fuel the giveaways so that money goes right back to you as far as what we're giving you each month in in the random selection giveaways also it goes to your eligibility to be able to go on the drives Um, And then overall, you're doing a great thing because you're helping us like be able to bring you information and bring up, bring you guys guests and people you want to hear from in the industry and talk about interesting topics. Um, You spend every Thursday with us. So we appreciate you you guys as family. um, And we would really appreciate it if you would consider becoming a PCAR club member because it really does make a huge, huge difference for us. Um, And thank you guys so much to everyone who has joined and who's continuing to support us. Let's go on a quick break, and then we're going to talk a little bit about RWBs and Speed Syndicate. Thank you guys listening to PCAR Talk so much. Uh, We appreciate you guys so, so, so much. I can't say that enough. Check us out on YouTube. Um, We release videos on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Um, Help support the channel. Um, Everything we're doing is trying to bring the community closer together. We definitely appreciate that. Also, when you go on the YouTube, um, you know, if you could subscribe, maybe pass it along, make a comment. We really appreciate that. Um, again, circling back to pcartalk.com, um, there is a newsletter created on there. Uh, please put your information in there. That way we can keep you up to date on anything that's coming forward and anything that we're going to be doing uh, moving forward and all the exciting things that are coming out. Now back to the show. All right, we're back from break. Um, so we're going to start collaborating in 2021. I kind of give you guys a little bit of an overview. We're going to work with Speed Syndicate on the first one. Um, anybody local kind of knows that we're already doing our PCAR breakfasts um, in the cooler months in Florida, I should yeah, say. Yeah, we're making it seasonal. Yeah, so so essentially come basically April, they're done until November comes around again because it's just, yeah. you know, the devil's prey going around out there and it's too hot, it's stupid, it's... We're it's not, rainy and then it's unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. and like we also kind of want to create where a sense of occasion too, because if it's every month, that's too much. And also some people are bringing air cool cars and people are like, well, it's too hot for bring my air cool car. And so we're just trying to eliminate excuses, streamline this thing. So in conjunction with maybe doing it for five months during that five month period, what we're probably going to end up doing is collaborating with at least two places annually moving forward to do a bigger event. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're ever down in the area, so this is going to be in Pinellas park. If you're not familiar with speed syndicate, um, we had Chris Valley on, he was on episode 80 and 81. If you yeah. guys want to like rewind back and see what they really do. Cause I don't want to go over that again, but this is going to be on February 13th at 2 PM. It's going to be at their shop. So it's not going to be just Porsche stuff though. So like if you're listening and you're local, um, and you want to come out, bring whatever you have to come hang out. Um, there's going to be parking in the street. Obviously there's going to be a lot of cars staged inside on purpose, um, in the shop because it's going to be an open house. So yeah. there's going to be some race cars there. There's going to be some street cars there. So it's going to be a good 
like showing basically of a mixture of cars, which is kind of cool. And we kind of want to get involved in that. You know, obviously we're going to bring all the pro Porsche crowd, but speed syndicate does everything. They do race prep cars, yeah. they do street cars. So they're going to have a mixture of stuff mixed the in. Racing, they do it. Yeah. They're going to have mixed in stuff with us as well. Um, but the most interesting part is I can't promise this, but there's been talk on the first phone call when I talked with Chris, um, they're probably going to have a keg. So it's probably going to be yeah. we're awesome. On like we're going to do beer. this, we're going to do this high school party style. Like, you know, bring your red cup and let's get down. Um, but it's just going to be fun. Uh, the, the, what the f weather in February in Florida is really, really nice. Yeah. Um, so it should be a good event. And then following up the month after that, we're going to probably be doing another event, but I'm not going to announce that until that's confirmed. Um, once I have the meeting after the first of the year with those people, um, that's going to be a street event. It's kind of be, be like a street festival type of deal, which is going to be pretty cool. And that's going to be in downtown St. Pete. Which is um, really cool. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty badass. Um, so, yeah, if you're in the area and you're visiting, come on down. Uh, again, that's February 13th on the, at 2 p.m. to whenever. Again, there's going to be refreshments. Come see some badass cars. Come talk to Chris. They build badass cars. Come talk to us. We'll be there. Uh, shoot the shit with us. Um, so it'd be cool. Like, again, it's not just a Porsche thing. So I'm sure you're going to pretty much see a lot of everything. Um, so there's a lot of good cars good out, there. Stuff out here. Yeah. So it'll be fun. Uh, so just want to give that quick update, um, to everybody who's listening, um, kind of branching out, doing a little bit of different stuff with that as far as like no. the in-person stuff. I think, like. Yeah. So I think it'll be really good for them and us. So let's move on. RWB. Obviously we talked about a little bit on this show, but not yeah. kind of indirectly. Saw one recently. Yeah, kind of indirectly. Um, so if you're not familiar with them, they're really big in the scene of like making uh, air cool cars more of kind of a race look. And they do race cars in idlers in Japan. Uh, that's where mm. this basically derivative is. If I have a whole episode where we talk about that, like I don't want to talk about their history right now. But but it's there. Just search RWB. Yeah. Um, it's pretty easy to find. But I think the, the interesting thing is they've been air-cooled only mm -hmm. up until recently. So they've ventured into 997s. Um, so they're doing water-cooled cars. And now the only cars that they're doing are 997 base Carreras. That's the only car they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, they're not doing turbos. They're not doing S's. They're not doing any of that stuff. They're only doing the narrow body one. And then they're making them wide bodies. Um so a couple things that I want to talk about this is not necessarily the process behind it, but I want to talk to you about your feelings behind, do you think this is going to dilute any of the air cool cars that he's already developed? And do you think that's going to create a riff within RWB as this far as... They'll be separate. I can tell you that right oh, now. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, it's... That's, I mean, just like the delineation between air cooled and, and water cooled. Is still so there. this is basically how this, this line's going to like develop. Yeah. Um, so you'll have the OGs, the guys that'll yeah. be the air cooled ones, and then you'll have the new school guys. Well, even within that, like I mean, we know, be like, oh, this is number two, or this is three, or you know, that type of. Well, I feel, I still feel like if you are an RWB air cooled guy, mm -hmm. I still think that they still accept you if you commission a build. I don't think it's more of like, oh, because you have build number sixty five, you're not as cool as the guy who has number two. Yeah, I think it's yes, they're numbered. But I think that those guys are a tight niche. I guess where I'm asking, and I probably didn't like word it properly, um, they're very family oriented as far as like they're super close. There's like they have it's a tech, they have a text string going on yeah. between them at all times, um, like group text. Um, they add in a new member when they get in. Um, do you think this becomes a part of that text string, or is they're going to have their own text string because That's, they're all uh, water cooled nine nine seven guys? I mean, because it's it's still it's still Nakai building them, so it's not like it's mm -hmm. somebody different and but labeled RWB. I have a feeling so a lot of touch. the air cooled guys that own them are going to also buy a water cooled one. I have that my, feeling. Now, as we know, and it sucks, but I'm going to go ahead and point out the elephant in the room. There's a drastic price difference oh, yeah. in between a 997 base career or water cooled car and entry point on an air cooled car yeah, to do these two things. Yeah. And the Delta is pretty big. So I'm not saying one should be better because one costs more, but you know what I'm going, where I'm going no. with this. There's going to be different entry level of people, types of people mm -hmm. who have these cars. You're going to have, let's just call them what yeah, they are. You're yeah, going to have your yeah, fuck boys out yeah. there that are going to buy these 997s. And I'm not saying that there's no air-cooled RWB fuck boys. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist either. But I'm saying there's going to probably be a lot more of them 
in the 997 range because I can go pick up a base Carrera yeah, 997 for what, 30 Gs yeah. maybe? And like then, ready to go yeah. and not even have to do paint on the car. Say if I buy a black, white, whatever, and I just want the wide body. So then I can do what? Dump another 25 grand and yeah. I can have an RWB for basically basically $55,000 as opposed to somebody who builds yeah, an air-cooled yeah. one you're barely at, 100 and, yeah. at 130 to 150 grand. I mean, you're talking a huge delta in price here. So do you, I think personally, that's going to create some animosity within the group. Yeah, that it's easier to, well, I mean, I, I get I Like some guys like, oh, you got it in on the easy way. Like well, you, you bought one of these run of the mill base 997s. Yeah, but the, the, they've been building it long enough where the, where the air cool market wasn't that expensive the entire time. But it's, I can see where if I was an RWB owner, air cooled wise, that I would want to have both. I can see that. Yeah. If you were just a Nakai fan, right? Yeah. I could see that. And there's plenty of people like that out there. I don't know that I 100% like the styling as much as I like the air-cooled styling. I think there's something different. I don't I don't know that it's... I think it'll come into its own. I think anything new yeah. is always like that. I think people even like when when they first came out, some people were all wide out and other people are like, eh, I don't know. Yeah. But um, I don't know if it's as drastic enough of a difference. I mean, I know that it's wide and I can see yeah. the stuff, but I don't know that... It, it, it's cartoony ooh. enough, essentially. Like, yeah, and it, I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean it more of kind of like where it's so standoutish, like the air cooled ones yeah. with like the wings and it the just, fighter it, stuff. Like it looks, me, it looks, it looks very RSR esque, like a nine nine six RSR. Mm -hmm. That wide, those arches, the flares, and it looks similar to that to me. More blendy, mm -hmm. maybe. I, I'm, I'm going to play devil's way, advocate for a minute. I'm not saying I feel either way about this. I'm just trying to point out some facts that might have a certain. I also like the idea of basically if you can afford the super expensive air-cooled one mm. and you're really a fan of Nakai, I think this also gives you an opportunity to get into a, a type of build that you're really interested in from somebody that you, you enjoy and you follow and you want somebody to build your car at a much cheaper rate. Yeah. So there is also that. I can see so, him expanding the market. Like, well, he could see that maybe, maybe it was slowing down. I doubt that it was really slowing down for air cool builds, but yeah. But then I don't think it is. A, I don't think it's slowing down. I think he's just he's just taking an opportunity new, to new expand avenue. expand yeah. his business. Well, there's a lot more of 997s than there were. Yeah, and from what I've understood, there. like I, what I've been reading, I don't know if he's going to be at every one of the 997 builds. I don't I don't know if that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this is just going to be a different arm of what he ends up doing. And I think he still does the air-cooled ones, obviously, yeah. himself. And I wonder if this is, maybe he goes to certain ones. Maybe if you're already a prior air-cooled customer, he goes to it. I don't know all the details behind it. Like, I can't... I, I can't think it might be a franchise move. I can't speculate. Yeah, maybe. I think... I the can speculate. I think the cool thing about it is, is it's giving people that were never going to have a chance to buy an air cooled. Uh, maybe the younger crowd, it does follow him to maybe go buy a nine, nine, seven. And maybe that's how they get into it. And if that's how they get into Porsche, whatever, I don't care. I mean, cause you like Nakai, that's cool. I mean, I think these cars could look cool too. I seen a couple of them, um, that he's already completed. I think they're kind of neat. Um, I, I not, not necessarily, I want one, but <laughs> does, it, does it, do you think it adds to the value? I mean, the same thing we talked about before the air cooled cars. Do you think it's adding value to these? I don't think so. Or, I, mean, I, don't I think just it's think it's a different take. Just different take. I think it's just whatever flavor you want to put on it. Be again, because they made so many of them, I don't think that has, has any impact. I don't think 997s all of a sudden start going up because he's doing that. And I don't think Nakai had anything to do with the air-cooled market impact either. I think all of that stuff kind of just happened all around the enthusiasts wanting the car anyways. Because let's let's – and people try to say, well, Singer impacts all of that stuff. I mean, think about how many 964s that actually made. They made tens of thousands of them. They yeah. made thousands. And, and I mean, you look at how many singers exist. What is there, like Not a, tens of thousands. 120 singers out there, maybe? Maybe 150? Yeah, I think, I think that's... And, 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 yeah, let's, yeah. And, let's, and let's just inflate the number. That, that Let's say they have four or 500 on deck ready to go. Let's just say that's the number. Yeah. Um, ready to go, already queued. Um, okay, so that's less than 1,000. Where's the rest of them? Yeah, exactly. There, there's not. 
Exactly. What what I'm getting at yeah. is is like where people say like, well, they're going up because Singer's buying them all. You know, and obviously that's a different card. It's like, oh, well, everybody's RW being them and everybody's doing this, and it's like, dude, that doesn't have any impact on this. It stuff. might put it. It might put like some sense of urgency to find something you like. Yeah, but they're still again. And then on top of that. Most of these guys who do le- legit RWB builds, not that, that there isn't a legit one, but there are corners to be cut as far as a buyer, as far as what you want to do, as mm. full repaint, maybe engine builds, all that kind of stuff. How nice you want to go with interior. I mean, it's sky's the limit, just like standard Porsche. If you buy a Porsche and you want to totally max the car out, that's possible too. Um, these Most of these guys that were buying these RWBs when they first started, these were clapped out air-cooled cars that they were actually breathing life back well, into. They weren't, they weren't afraid to cut up. They're like, yeah. okay. That's I was like, bad. man, look at this basket yeah. case. It needs a paint job. Okay, if we're going to paint it anyways, let's do this to it. Mm. Let's do that to it. So they're not like cutting up blue chip cars like we've said many, many episodes ago when we talked about this. And I kind of have the feeling that's probably what's going to happen with these 9997s. I mean, not they're going to all be like crashed ones that people are doing, but... No one's buying a blue chip 997 base Carrera C2 and going in RWBing it. It's like true. people that are buying these, let's be real. They're going to 120,000 mile cars that are probably in Arctic silver with gray or black interior that you don't even want to buy when it's sitting the way it is. So don't get pissed off when they build this and chop this thing up and make it cooler than it was because it was grandpa spec anyways. Yep, or, or it was super poverty spec. Anyways, so it doesn't matter. They're actually breathing more life into this thing and making it better. And I'm not saying that as a soapbox def- defense for RWBB. I'm just saying there's a lot of people that are uneducated about what happens to these cars, and I'm just trying to breathe some education into people behind it. People are like, oh, man, I can't believe you cut that beautiful car up. It's like, did you see this thing? When it, dude, this thing came in on a trailer and had three different kinds of wheels on it. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I think it's kind of neat. Um I like what he's doing. I like that he's not saying staying so specific in the air cooled area. I I think it's interesting. Anytime somebody has a creative mind and wants to do out something outside of it, I always encourage that because you never know. Yeah. Yeah. You never know what this may blossom after he does a nine, nine, seven. Who knows? Nine, nine, two is here to come. Yeah. Who knows what he may do? Like it, it, it just turns into one of those things. You just never know. Maybe he just builds a full, full body kit instead of just, Fenders. Maybe he does a whole car. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I just think it's nice to see creative people doing something in a creative space. So I think it's really cool. So, and I'm sure we'll start seeing a lot more of them because they're going to be a lot more affordable. So as, as quick as Nakai can get them popped out or his staff's going to popped out, we're in a hot bed for it. So I'm sure we're going to see some. At least one or two. Yeah. Uh, before we close out, um, one more question about that RWB situation. Now, if you had one, like where we talked about some of the air-cooled ones where people don't really dive into the motor and they kind of yep. leave it and it's kind of a letdown where they don't make it as powerful or whatever. Now, because the entry point is a little bit less, do you think people tinker with the 997 motor a little bit? Maybe do they throw a supercharger on yeah, it to the, make it a little bit more... Superchargers, definitely. To make it a little bit more yeah. oomph where it's kind of like, okay, it's not all just show. Like this thing's got like some balls in it. You might want to because if you didn't, you're adding so much, you're adding weight. Yeah. To something that already has 300 and some horsepower to the crank or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You're putting 14 inch wide wheels on it. So why not give it some horsepower, right? Um, I think if I was to do one ever, if I was going to do a 997, I 100% put a supercharger on it. I think the supercharger is the way to go. Yeah. That way it still kind of feels NA power where you don't have the turbo boost on it. Yeah. You just kind of use that motor that you got. It's almost a 500 horsepower increase, I think, something like that with a V of engineering. That would be a beast. Yeah. Now, now that car would be pretty stout That's at that point. That's close to GT three territory. Yeah, and then you would have the RWB look behind it. So anybody who's listening, think you're going to do it, you got to put a supercharger on it because you're yeah. saving money, not buying an air cooled, going water cooled. So, true. so nut up and buy the supercharger yeah, for it. Even if you did that, that's ten. So you like should 65. almost make that a requirement. <laughs> like if you're, you got to buy my supercharger kit too, he needs a bank. He <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah. No, just third kit. party them through yeah. like VF and make yeah. basically like they're VFs, just the but kit. he just puts them on yeah. the side and just puts them all together. The kit's now 35. Like, yeah. Just makes it that's this is the way it has to be. Yep. But, uh, I don't have anything else. Do you have anything else for them? I don't. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us once again. We really, really do appreciate you guys listening and please consider joining the PCAR club. 
You guys have a very, very safe new year, and we will see you when we click over it in 2021. Yeah, 2021, new yeah. year. Yeah, let's turn it over. Get rid of this, right? Yep. See ya. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of PCAR Talk. Connect with us on Instagram at PCAR Talk or online at PCARTalk.com.